Hello! I'm back. I'm doing this video for the main channel because it's actually a, a, a series I meant to do in 2021 of kind of Phil Spector and his uh, the girl bands he produced and, and the wall of sound upon doing a ton of research while everything else was happening. Access can kind of do that in two separate videos and so this video is going to be the wall of sound video. So what the wall of sound is, it's a it's a recording technique in more or less invented by Phil Spector. Uh, people like Todd Rundgren later used it. Uh, Brian Wilson who Phil Spector was probably the only producer Phil, Spe Phil Spector uh, whatever openly respect used it and I'm going to cover that in a little bit. So what this playlist is, is the the first few songs in the playlists on this playlist are songs that Phil Spector directly produced and that directly used the original wall of sound. And what we're talking about for that is let's we'll actually go over the list for a second in order to kind of break this up a bit. So the first four songs that, or the first three songs, I can actually, I should probably reorganize this. So the first three songs on the list, which are the Ronettes Be My Baby, Unchained Melody, and Today I Met the Boy I'm Gonna Marry by Darlene Love. Unchained Melody is the Rogers Brothers. Be My Baby is the Ronettes. To the day I met the boy I'm gonna marry, by Darlene Love, are the f are the first three songs on the list, and they're songs that directly use the wall of sound technique. And to give you kind of an overview, there's a bunch of videos and websites on it. I'm really doing an overview just to get for the playlist and to kind of talk about not Phil Spector the man so much, but I want to get into what he, what the technique was and kind of from a future standpoint, kind of what the wall of sound did for music. Hopefully this won't go like terribly long. So what the wall of sound kind of does as a building technique from a recording standpoint is he take a good song and usually he work with people in the Brill Building uh, and the Brill Building, you probably, I probably do a whole other uh, video just on the Brill Building and the musicians and songwriters that came out of the Brill Building even And so, and I didn't actually use, though I will add, go back and add this to the list. So probably the first song that, pe that everybody kind of knows that does the wall of sound sound, like the quintessential wall of sound sound, is You Lost That Love and Feeling by the Righteous Brothers. And what it is, is, so there's a, you, you do the basic backing track, you record it live, and you, you start to overdub say like the bass and maybe the drums and then what you end up doing is is you layer other sounds on top of it so like on a song you might have a you might play a piano and I'm trying to think of the song that I found that actually does this let it be actually the let it be which I didn't put on this list does it I'm gonna get to that whole controversy in a second so but you have a, 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 a piano track as the track, as the bass track for whatever, for the song you're working on. And then what he'll do is he'll layer a harpsichord over the piano, for example. Or he'll have a setup where he'll have two pianos, he'll have like, or two or three pianos. And then he'll put horns and bass and trombones and like three saxophones on top of it. So it gets to be this huge, in the layering part of the process, it's this huge wall of sound. And then he adds, in some songs, an echo. And it's said by, by like Phil, Jeff Berry, who's one of uh, Phil's closer uh, arrangers and producers that he kind of worked with, he had like a whole crew. The echo was totally like Phil's deal like that he came with his own formula for the echo the spill is something that he that uh, some people in his crew did not like 
And what spill basically is his mic bleed. So like he'll be, you can play a guitar in, you'll be in a studio and everything's walled off. And what he'll have uh, on some songs, what he'll do is, uh, like on the mix for Zippity Doodah, which is song another song I didn't include. Maybe I'm a, this this list might be longer than I think it will be. So Billy Strange, because there's a whole slew of session musicians that Phil specifically used for his work, and he's just he'll have a, a track for an electric guitar. And what'll happen is he'll be playing it and he'll turn the mic off for the electric guitar, but leave the mics open in another room. So you can hear it as mic bleed. But the way he'd mix it, because the mic wouldn't because the guitar wouldn't have a mic on its own, it has a it, it to quote Billy Strange, we'll have a different ambient space from the, record, from the rest of the track. So, like, you can play it mic'd. And then, because maybe, because, like, let's say, for example, like, the door is open, but the sound, the sound of the guitar will spill, spill onto other mics in the room. So the other mics in, say, on the vocal track will pick it up, and it's a background noise. And so it just adds to the overall layer of that vocal track. And then the other thing is, is that, so, there's the, the controversy around Phil Spector and mono recording. So, Phil Spector hated stereo. He kind of hated like the stereo sound. And so he recorded a lot of things Monorally, and it's one of the reasons why there are four or five, depending on the album you pick up, different versions of Let It Be. So there's the Wings version of Let It Be, which everybody knows is McCarty. There's Phil Spector's version of Let It Be is what's known as either the album or the naked version of Let It Be, where it's just recorded in mono. There's another version the single version of Let It Be is the stereo version. And overall, I was listening to these earlier today and I didn't include them on the playlist because I pretty much had to listen to both of these songs for about 45 minutes to kind of break down the differences in how they sound because it's, it's not right off the top that you get it. It's kind of, especially when you listen to them back to back, the naked version, it's a beautiful version because it because you hear all four Beatles singing different parts of the song and that's that's amazing. Not that McCartney's version is it, but it's not necessarily stripped down. Like I, one of the things that I, I kind of begun to think about when doing these playlists and thinking about the music that I put into them is how in the nineties people my age kind of fell in love, re-fell in love with the whole acoustic idea. And that music was stripped down when it was acoustic. And so listening to something being stripped down from a recording standpoint is different. Because I had never, I had never really listened to a bunch of stuff in mono before. And, and that uh, might end up taking me on a journey of just listening to different, because there's a bunch of stuff that's recorded in mono that I never even thought about. But it, it's it's different because the way from I'll give you a quote from Brian Wilson on that one uh, on the whole discussion of monaural sound, and he says, "quote I look at it like I look at sound like a painting. You have to balance. You have to have a balance, and the balance is conceived in your mind. You finish the sound, dub it down, and you stamp out a picture. You stamped out a picture of your balance with a mono dub down." But in stereo, you leave that dub down to the, to the listener, to his speaker placement, his speaker balance. It just doesn't seem complete to me, unquote. That's pet sounds in a nutshell. Wouldn't it be nice is Brian Wilson's attempt. I wouldn't even say attempt because he actually knocks it out of the park. Pet sounds is probably one of the, I'd say 50 most important albums in music just because of the strides it makes in recording in general. 
in fact, um, and this is just my opinion, because I, I, I've lately I've run into like I'll be doing research for some of these playlists, and I ran into a whole there's a film documentary. I think of the making of Led Zeppelin four and. The part that I got super fascinated on, because I'm a big John Bonham fan, is uh, is Jimmy Page talking about the mic placement on the drums. Zeppelin was one of the first bands to go, not one of the first bands, because the Eagles did it. A bunch of bands got into where we're going to record in this house, or we're going to record somewhere other than the studio, because people started really getting into how stuff sounded before you put it on wax. And so for... Page was like, Bottom has this huge sound, but how can we make it sound bigger without doing a bunch of stuff to it? And so Page accidentally put a mic somewhere and it was like, oh, he gets to the playback, like, wait, 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 wait. And so they got into this whole, it, there's like a 30, 45 minute whole thing on this, on just the mic placement for the drums on when the levy breaks. Which gave me a whole different appreciation of that song, but that's, I don't know that you get to discoveries like that without the wall of sound. There's some other songs that I ended up doing, because this is already a little bit long. This is a, there's a couple other songs that I want to talk about too real quick, the modern versions of what gets covered in the wall of sound. Total Eclipse of the Heart by Bonnie Tyler is a is Todd Rundgren's attempt at the wall of sound. Todd does a, does a lot of different things studio wise where he does different things with space than Phil Spector did. They, and and, and uh, a lot of the wall of sound too isn't just having a, a cacophony of sound. A lot of times the magic happens in the spaces between the beats. For Phil Spector, he even said that his masterpiece for the wall of sound, like he's he's like, if there's a song that you want to understand how this works, it's probably River Deep Mountain High by I Can Tina Turner. He's like, that's the best thing I ever did with this whole thing. Everything else was downhill as far as he was concerned. And so then that's actually on the playlist. Uh, the indie take, or the modern, the postmodern alternative take on the wall of sound is just like Honey by the Jesus and Mary Chain. But everybody's heard like Unchained Melody or You've Lost That Loving Feeling or Then He Kissed Me by The Crystals which has been in a bunch of films. He walked up to me and asked me if he wanted to dance. You'll, you'll hear it. I left out Born to Run. And the reason I left out Born to Run is because it's, it's, it's one of the 80s things that Phil Spector did and he recorded it as a wall of sound idea the interesting thing about it and why the reason I left it off this list is there's a separate list I want to do where the artist is much more involved in how their thing sounds than just being artists there's a lot of situations I've, I've come across where the artist goes in the studio and they play and they leave it up to the producer to make it sound good. It's one of the reasons why people used to say on the early records that George Martin was the fifth Beatle. And then you get artists like Springsteen who are like, I want to do eight vocal tracks and two overdubs. There's a whole story I found today about the recording of Born to Run. And there's also a 2005 documentary on it, which I started watching. I was like, I'm way too deep on the Springsteen thing. I really just want to do this. So there's that. That I have to, I'm going to watch the documentary before I do that list because there's a bunch of artists in the 80s and 90s that really got into having a close relationship with the producer, sometimes even marrying the producer, and having a real hands-on approach to how the songs were made, how the songs were put together. And I want to kind of go back a little earlier than that and talk about Fleetwood Mac and their whole studio structure. That's a whole separate, probably longer video than this. But that's the Wall of Sound retrospective. The 
playlist that will go on that that kind of bookends this situation. Probably going to put it out next week because there's two personal playlists I'm putting out today. I want to use this to break that break that up a little bit, and it's those other two playlists on the other channel, mistakes and mistakes. But I want to kind of do something educational over here, so that's what I'm doing. So, but I'm I'm going to do this. So I got the Bruce Springsteen thing. I got in the pipeline. I got the Ronette's perspective, like the artists of Phil Spector, because I I really feel like Ronnie Spector deserves her own due. So. That's this educational segment. That's the Wallace Town retrospective. Uh, let me know if you like, share, subscribe. Well, please like, share, subscribe this video. Give me some feedback, some what you think about it. Because I didn't want it to be like 30 minutes. So, I right. Peace and that, folks.